Hello everyone! Blizzard Entertainment recently released a brand new short story called A Moment in Verse, written by Madeline Roux. The story revolves around Lord Marfaron and First Arcanist Felistra. It is a really, really solid story. Well written, very cute, really immersive. And a lot of you asked if we could do a retelling of it. Which of course, I am more than happy to do so. However, Felistra does have a couple of lines. And as much as my higher pitched voice sounds really, really good, I thought it would be a better plan to actually recruit some aid. So the lovely charm, moments notice, she was like, I'm there, I'm your Felistra. So a big shout out to Charm. Thank you very much for offering your voice to this video. It's going to be like a midnight nibbler, so they're intended to just listen to, relax, chill, enjoy the story. And might I suggest to go on over on Twitter, I'll put a link in the description down below, as there's a section in the story, a sonnet, which is actually voice acted by Lord Marfaron also known as Gideon Emery. If you want to hear a professional performing this, then by all means go check out that link. But with that, without further ado, I hope you sit back, relax, and enjoy. A Moment in Verse by Madeline Rue It was bitterly cold upon the water, the surface of it smooth as glass, rippling only along the edges of the boat. Lord Marfaron had insisted on coming by the sea, by the old way. He wanted to absorb it all, not teleport it instantly to the gates of Sudamar City, but seeing it as it was meant to be seen. And there it was, shimmering domes unfolding slowly above a still blue lake, the tall crystalline towers looming like mountains sculpted by ancient gods. Gods, he mused with a delicate touch and graceful sensibility. For though Sudamar City had stood for 10,000 years and more, it looked fragile enough to shatter at a mere tremor. They paused the imposing central hub of Astravar Harbor, floating towards the moonlit landing, where lush purple ferns unfurled like welcome banners and pale violet flowers bobbed beneath a canopy of blossoming sapphire branches. The boat cut across the looming shadow of the nighthold, on toward the empty docks below the landing. First Arcanist Felistra had invited him to come. The invitation so long standing, he had simply run out of excuses to forestall the visit. It was not lack of want that kept him away, but the endless demands made upon his time. As leader of the Sindori, a member of the newly formed Horde Council, his time was split between the concerns of Silvermoon City and pressing requests from Orgrimmar. Lorfmar felt split in two, and neither half his own. This visit, this indulgence, did not belong to either half, but rather floated somewhere in the middle, in the corner of his heart, where his own interests lay withered and all but forgotten. Though he occasionally took the liberty of a quiet afternoon to read, those moments brought precious little rest. He often found himself abandoning his book in favor of his journal. Poems and snatches of verse spring into mind, many of them returning to the same topic again and again. His potently beautiful dusk lily. It felt suddenly ridiculous to be gliding along in that little boat, a single night-born oarsman rowing them toward the foot of the great city. He did not belong there. This time did not belong to him. It belonged to his people and to the Horde. Lorfmar glanced over his shoulder, back the way they'd come. A fog had closed in as if to trap him, as if to say, Too late. Your path is chosen. The oarsman shot him a questioning glance, but Lorfmar said nothing, gazing over the elf's white hair at the quaint silver lanterns glowing on the docks. He was not going into battle, yet his chest ached with a familiar tension. He knew well that anticipation and fear were kin, sometimes impossible to tell apart. Like the tricky duo, he carried only two things on his person, his sword on his belt, hanging at his left side, and a small, worn, leather-bound journal in his right hand. That heady mixture of anticipation and fear had made his hands grow slick and now the pages beneath the ladder had gone clammy with his nervousness. He shivered, pulling the thick, crimson cloak 
embroidered with gold suns closed about his shoulders, watching his breath puff across the closing distance between bow and landing. Then the boat slowed, gliding past a pair of elegant cranes that watched him go by without a ruffled feather, impervious to the cold and to the intrusion. Steady yourself, the oarsman warned, and then the boat nosed against the dock. The Nightborn reached for the nearest post, holding them in place while Lorfmar disembarked. Thank you for safe passage, Lorfmar told him, and the oarsman inclined his head once, smiling, and then pushed away, slicing back into the perfect lily-dusted waters. At last you have arrived. Lorfmar whirled, caught off guard. Finding first Arcanist Felistra had not sent a page to escort him, but rather had come herself. She stood, observing him from the stairs leading up to the moonlit landing. Her voice carried easily across the water as she stood as still and perfect and lavender as the birds bathing calmly behind him. He bowed slightly at the waist and then strode a short distance from the end of the dock to the dizzying set of steps leading up the gilded market. Its bustle slowed with night coming on. The tightness in his chest had not eased and it only increased as he closed the gap between them. Felistra's smile widened at his approach, a slender purple hand appearing from inside a rune-etched cape. No longer wearing her more warlike robes of state, she addressed for the chill in the air in sumptuous, touchable velvet. No doubt imbued with a warm spell, a simple crystal diadem atop her crown of silvery white braids. When Lorfmar accepted her hand, it was cool and dry, the light shifting of her cloak, sending a hint of her lilac perfume to torment him. I hardly believe my eyes, she said with a light laugh as Lorfmar tucked her hand under his smoothly and took her arm. They turned toward the city together and began the ascent. You might have given me longer to prepare, Regent Lord. I had to call back six disgruntled poets from their expeditions. They harangued me for hours. Fortunately, not in verse. My apologies, he replied in deep baritone. As you might imagine, it was not easy to escape my responsibilities in Silvermoon, particularly on business of such a uh, personal nature. Felistra waved him off. There were those damned lilacs again. It was going to make him dizzy. Do not apologize, please. A bit of strife is good for them. They need something to write poems about after all. And how is Quelth, alas? If I close my eyes, I can still picture the winding path through the red and gold wood, the leaves swirling against my feet on a wood smoke wind. Such poetry already, my lady. I have come ill prepared for our contest, Lorfmar chuckled, yet he appreciated every word. Even the thought of Silvermoon City and its golden spires gave him a pang. My absence will be felt and resented, I am sure. But when I left, there were no fires in urgent need of extinguishing. That wasn't exactly true. Both Halderon Brightwing and Romav had taken an unusual interest in his journey to Sudomar. The words, Go, you love Edel Buffoon, or I will strangle you myself, might even have left Romav's lips before Lorfmar departed. They took the stairs one by one, the lowland chill of the harbor dropping away slightly as they climbed. Pearlescent railings outlined a path to the city proper, where well-armed and armored nightborn patrolled the empty markets. Resent? Nonsense. Felistra nudged him, and Lorfmar clung to his journal more tightly. You are staying but two days. A rare luxury for me. The demands from Orkhamar alone are... Lorthamar. She squeezed his forearm through his cloak, and perhaps felt a tension that gripped him from head to foot. This is not how I mean to go on. The Nyborn stopped and stepped back, facing him. Her diamond bright eyes glittered in the early evening gloom, even more arresting in the dark. Lorfmar struggled to meet her gaze, worried that a lecture might be coming on. But she held his hand gently and did not let him look away. Let your worries drop away, if only for these two days. This... This is but a moment, a moment out of time. The sorrows and concerns that fill your head, let them be stones and drop them in the water. 
You may scoop them up as you glide away, but for these precious days they reside buried in the sand. Yes. He grins. Even just the words spoken, in her low and soothing voice, were a spell that briefly banished the worries circling in his head. The cursed pain in his chest did not abate, but he knew it would not until she was gone from his side again. Very well, Lorfmar told her. This is our moment out of time. I will hold you to that, Felistra cautioned, tilting her head down. Then I shall make it a promise, my lady. One I will not break. Excellent. Her arm nested in his again, and they continued their journey through the market. For I would have you fit of mind and spirit for our competition. I will thrash you, of course, but only on fair grounds. Lower from our smirked. My lady is confident in her tall, tall tower, I see. How much more dramatic than the fall will be? You are already rhyming, she teased, dissolving into laughter. And so poorly, too. This will be triflingly easy, Regent Lord. A pity you came so far to be trounced without real effort. Now you recalled those poets from their travels for nothing, Lord Marset, shrugging. Oh, not for nothing, she assured him, as they paused by twisting braziers lit with purple fire that illuminated them both. Not for nothing, Lothamar. For this moment... For us. A modest but keen audience awaited them in a midnight court. Felistra had not exaggerated. A half dozen wizened faces stared in ready silence, their lips pursed preemptively with judgment. Those were the poets, Lorfmar concluded, and among them sat a few friendlier faces, all of them Sheldorai. Some of those faces were flushed from the arc wine poured liberally by circulating servants. What had begun? as a private wager between the two of them and Najatar had apparently become a full-fledged spectacle. Lorfmar took it as a compliment. Felistra must have been confident in his skills, or else this would make for poor sport in public. Then we are to begin, he muttered, and so unceremoniously. Ah, oh, but you will be wined and dined when the evening's entertainment has concluded. It is not often we entertain leaders from abroad. Felistra explained, escorting Lorfmar to the gathering. So I hope you can understand their eagerness. Such events are galvanizing, you see. They lend legitimacy to our newly liberated city. I have no doubt tonight's festivities will be put down in song and verse, and will not soon be forgotten. Then I shall endeavor not to disappoint, Lorfmar said. He meant it as a jest, but inside he was quivering. The friendly poetry competition between he and the first arcanist, felt like a private thing, an inside joke, proof that the bond was growing. He had not expected it to suddenly involve an audience, and one that looked middling receptive at best. No, no, let it not be too terribly serious for us, dear Lothamar, she urged, snatching two goblets of arc wine as a servant wandered by. With a wide smile, she offered him the second cup. He sipped cautiously, Aware of the wine's potency, the first taste of it was as electric as the light shining in the first arcanist's eyes. A moment ago, you were sheer bravado, my lady, Lorfmar reminded her. The gathered audience took their seats, leaning over to whisper giddily between them, while he and Felistra still stood before them. Having second thoughts? Never. She clinked her glass lightly against his. But I find it is so much better to lose gracefully. I look forward indeed to observing how you handle it. Lorfmar quelled his cutting remark by taking another drink from his cup. A servant appeared from the shadows around the court, bringing with him a wooden podium. The chairs had been arranged under a domed pavilion with a dark plum-colored roof. A soaring and slender statue rises behind their audience. The soft water whispers of Sudamar Bay, washing against the courts, was joined by a harp and singer drifting down from one of countless towers above. From his vantage, he could glance back toward the market and see rows and rows of domes like the one they stood beneath, each shining and magenta, like perfect droplets of wine spilled a marble slab. After the podium was arranged, Felistra joined him there and turned to face their audiences or rather their judges. Lorfmar shifted in place, 
more accustomed to giving rousing speeches before battle than holding up his personal poetry to strangers for scrutiny. Fair poets and citizens of Suramar, I bid you all welcome and good evening. Felistra called out, raising her goblet. Others went up a response. We have an honored guest with us this evening. A ranger, a leader, a cinderai of enduring bravery and commitment to his people. But in this warrior's chest beats a poet's heart. And he is here among us this evening to share the tastes and passions of far-off Quelthalas. I trust you will receive him graciously and listen while he regales us. As he is our guest, he has the honor of speaking first. His good eye twitched, but he plastered on a smile and bowed as the assembled Cheldorai clapped politely, many upon their wrists. They appeared keenly interested in him. Studying closely, this Sindora ranger, their leader invited to Sudomar with such fanfare. And what a pleasure it is to be in this city of ancient wonder and tradition, graced with the presence of venerable artists and thinkers, Lord Marset, watching Felistra melt to the shadows of the pavilion. Though she stood in the darkness, he could see only her. I only lament that I waited so long to accept the first Arcanist kind invitation, he finished. Clearing his throat, Lorfmar extricated the little journal from the deep folds of his cloak. On the boat ride over, he had ample time to consider his choice. A sober, political piece seemed right given the audience. He doubted the old poets of Sudamar were interested in the more personal, sentimental pieces that he'd been writing lately when thoughts of a beautiful first arcanist crept unbidden into his head. A poem in the tradition of Silvermoon. Lorfmar announced, to murmurings of interest. This is a sonnet I have titled, The Adder. <clears throat> Pressing his palm to the journal to keep it flat and legible, Lorfmar spared one last glance at Felistra, who encouraged him with a subtle nod. He adjusted his cloak, took a deep breath, and began. Consider the adder, its poison weak. No threat to the strong, fangs and bite mere show. Its colors, kingly raiment, yet it seeks. Prey in the shadows and dark places low. So when it strikes, the victim deep in woe. A wounded soul or body near to death. The poison comes on wings of swift sorrow. Behold now the coy adder's truest theft. Of the small and tired, the young the bereft. A moment's weakness, the end of the bold, the impossible arrow, unkindly deft, and fledged like the snake in crimson and gold. So beware the humble little adder, lest it bite you when it cruelly matters. Thank you, Lord said in closing. To the building applause of the poets and nobles seated before him, Felicia emerged from the shadowy portico, tapping her fingers on her wrists to show her appreciation. It was a subdued response, but Lorfmar was not in the habit of sharing his poems publicly, and he would take their politeness over stunned, disgusted silence. Marvelously done, she told him as they paused, and she took his place at the podium. And I shall speak extemporaneously, as we have done here in the Midnight Court for thousands of years, as so many have done before me, and as so many will do after. Moved to verse by the spirit of the moment. The moment. Lorfmar leaned against the nearest column, enjoying the purple brazier light, wash over Felistra as a word drew the lighted gas from the audience. The moment, their moment out of time. He was impressed that she chose to improvise, but then he knew that she was an extraordinary woman. Felistra lifted her delicate, pointed chin toward the heavens and opened her arms wide, as if receiving the full embrace of the darkening evening and the coming starlight. He found himself leaning forward, just like the other poets and onlookers, drawn toward her, wrapped. The whole night sees us, wretched, beautiful, 
Beneath those untold, unblinking eyes, we dance, we drink, we give body to the watchful heavens, becoming hands and feet, becoming. Here I am, take my fingers to grasp the goblet, take my lips to breathe your first air, take my feet and learn to twirl and fall. Tumble and I shall catch you. Laugh and I shall laugh with you. Until all of our shining eyes are stars. And we see each other. One cosmos. One heart. The silence after Felistra finished felt galvanizing in its completeness, as if he and all the others there in the court saw with the same eyes and breathed with the same lungs as her poem compelled them to do. They were moved to applause as one too. Lorfmar was already standing, but the audience joined him, leaping to their feet. For his part, he was not concerned with the quality of the poetry, but with the depth of feeling in the recitation he might have known. She would make such an entrancing performer. The first arcanist was luminous on a bad day, an incandescent on a good one. But there, soaked in starlight and caught up in a poetic trance, she shamed the white lady herself. Magnificent! A poet sitting to his right cried out, snatching the words from Lorfamar's mind. The poet's silver hair fell in a perfect sheet down his back and he wore a large glimmering amethyst around his neck. His robes rustled softly as he joined first Arcanist Felistra at the podium, giving her the bow with open arms. You are all so kind, she murmured, touching the fingertips of her right hand to her throat. My assistant Glendron took down every word. The poet gestured for that assistant to come forward, and a younger nightborn boy meekly scuttled toward the podium. Ah, there's Glendron. I did not want to miss a single intonation, First Arcanist. I have so many questions about your piece, as I'm sure we all do. More wine must be fetched, of course. But then we may begin our discussion. Lorfmar stifled a groan. I think not, Felisna said gently, laying her hand on the poet's forearm. Why not break for a light meal first, Radin? Our guest must be famished. You may ask him as many questions as you like once he is fed and more at his ease. Oh, of course. Redrin bowed again, snagging Glendron by the sleeve and tugging him away, back towards the row of chairs. We're at your command, First Arcanist. But Rerdin shot a cold glance in Lorfmar's direction, as if he alone were responsible for this lapse in decorum. It did not bother him overmuch. He would much prefer to talk poetry with the First Arcanist in private. The opinions of dusty old poets didn't matter to him, but hers mattered greatly. Then it is decided. We shall reconvene in, say, two hours? Felistra said, more generally to those assembled. A few looked crestfallen at the thought of waiting so long, but she breezed by their sour faces, swooping in to take Lorfmar by the arm and escort him away. Only the servant, offering wine followed, trailing behind them at the discreet distance. You read my mind, Lorfmar told her with a chuckle, as they wandered away from the court, skirting around one of its rounded towers, following a path that led to a set of narrow stairs. A timely intervention. They mean well, and I do value their thoughts. They are some of our brightest artistic minds, but Rodin in particular is... Well, he has a tendency to ramble. I can much better withstand his speeches after a fortifying supper. At the top of the winding stair, a small terrace awaited. There they found a round table with two chairs, as well as a light course of poached night pears and pickled sandpiper eggs to whet the appetite. The servant hovered, waiting until Lorfmar had helped the first arcanist to her chair, before dutifully filling their cups and disappearing back down the stairs. For a moment, Lorfmar simply sat quietly, drinking in the view of the harbor, listening to the idle harp player above take up their song again. When he closed his eyes, he felt warm and at peace, a sensation that shocked his eyes back open. 
he had almost lost the prickle of anxious tension, always locking his back into place. But no, there it was, as familiar as a rude old friend. Is something the matter, Lothamar? She asked, watching him, her eyes sparkling above the rim of her cup. Just remembering your orders, first arcanist, Lorfmar said. Reality intruded for an instant, but I will banish it. Felistra gave a pretty laugh. See that you do, and see that you dispense with this unnecessary formality, Lorthamar. You must call me Thalisra. Now, before the poets have their fun interrogating you, I should like a turn. I am at your mercy. Her eyes glowed brighter at that. Your poem. Would I be correct in assuming it is about the failures of Kelthas Sunstrider? Indeed. Lorthamar nodded and tried a bit of soft, wine-poached pear. He shifted in his chair. Was, was this not supposed to be an evening of joy? Now his mood was beginning to turn dark. Your thoughts linger in the past, then. He is lately much on my mind, Lord Mar admitted. And the treachery our people faced, when we were already at our weakest. Not just our people, but the personal treachery. I trusted him. Curse it all. I followed him and believed him, and I would have seen our people blighted by fell energy, because that was what he asked of me. Felistra made a soft sound of acknowledgement. Such wounds are slow to heal. A poisoned wound takes all the longer, Lorfmar continued, and reopens eagerly in uncertain times. But how could I not return to such memories? I cannot help but see the similarities. The Horde's armies are depleted. Our treasuries emptied, our resources stretched thin. A blow to us now would... Well, I'm sure you can easily imagine the outcome. He pinched the bridge of his nose and shook his head. And there I go, back to our grim reality. Felistra's smile dimmed, but did not fade away entirely. Pulling back her velvet sleeve, she reached across the table for his hand. Lorfmar regarded her slender fingers for a moment, before pressing his palms to hers. Finding that the moment he did, those dark thoughts scattered, as if her mere touch were a lantern, warding off the shadows. I had hoped my poem would stir something in you, but I think you missed its meaning entirely. Alas, I shall have Rodin burn all his copies. What? You mustn't, not because any failure of mine. You did not fail, she said quickly, squeezing his hand. Please do not look so downcast. Lorfmar frowned, puzzled. No, of course, I'm fine. A little confused, perhaps, but fine. Fine. She spat the word out and shivered. Then she withdrew, and at once he missed her calm and warmth. Felistra leaned away in her chair, letting her head fall back, exposing the fine architecture of her neck, her pale tattoos glowing brighter as she closed her eyes and breathed deeply. You did not fail, Lothamar. I spoke what was in my heart before you all tonight to show you the vanishing precious joy we can have. War has come. War will come again. These are uncertain times, yes, but I am old enough to have watched my people rise and fall and rise once more. And I myself have withered like the winter tree before blossoming anew. In all that time and chaos, I knew sorrow and elation, but I was never fine. I submerged myself completely in the pain and in the pleasure. He took a sip of wine, but it did not numb him the way he expected. It was as Felicita desired, her words stirring something in him. It is a paltry word, I suppose. Fine, not a word for poetry. Or for life. She finished for him. She leaned toward him again and nodded, grinning. Dear Lothamar, I have watched you wear the heavy mantle of your people and sink beneath it, almost pushed into the ground. Those failures of your prince are not yours, and you must not fill them as if they were your own. Lorfmar stared at her, chilled as if naked. Behind the walls of Silvermoon, he felt at home and safe but also unseen, as if the city could swallow him up 
and make him invisible to the ghouls that haunted his dreams and his waking hours. But here he found no such walls to protect him, to hide him. It is no simple thing to shake off the betrayals my people and I have known. That I have known it will take time, a long, long time. Felicita's brows rose slowly up her forehead. How long? One cannot rush healing or forgiveness. When she reached for his hand again, he almost didn't take hers, but that would be petty. And he did long for her touch again. Lorfamar closed his eyes and their fingers entwined. More talk of wounds. Are you healing? Or daily cutting open those poisoned wounds because they are familiar, not comfortable, but yours. Lorfmar flinched. Her thumb soothed across the top of his hand, rubbing over and over again, as if trying to make an indent on a wishing stone. He remembered the moment of his prince betrayal well. In less than a blink, he saw again the undead marching on his folk, heard the vicious gossip of those who had always doubted Kilfas and who mocked Lorfmar's loyalty almost nightly. Hard visions of the Sunwell being polluted by the void after he allowed Illyria Windrunner near it tormented him. But he knew the woman holding his hand had endured as much as he had, perhaps more. Yet still a smile leaped redly to her face, and here she sat, counseling him towards something he doubted he even deserved. Those wounds are familiar, yes, and mine, Lorfmar admitted. I have so little that is my own now. Remove them from me, and what do I possess? Nothing. Not nothing, Lorthamar. Open your eyes. Tell me what you see. His eyes were already open, but perhaps not in the way she wanted. So Lorthamar looked again, harder, seeing the woman across from him, radiant and patient, and wondered if he would ever be fine again. We have danced around it so long, he said with a dry laugh. I did not know. Yes, you did. Yes, you do. Lorfmar felt suddenly sheepish and found it hard to meet her eye. Yet she stared back at him boldly, and he forced himself to do the same. The effect was instant. He stood, still holding Felithra's hand, ready to have more than his troubles his sorrows and his memories, ready to do as she had, to submerge himself in pain, or more pressingly, pleasure. The messenger chose that moment to arrive, tearing up the stairs and skidding to a stop, not four feet from where Lorfmar stood, in Sudamar's livery, a fresh-faced young Sheldorai lad, out of breath and sweating, tumbled out onto the terrace, their way that he turned to, a step or two behind the messenger, fumbling out apology after apology for the intrusion. M message for you, Regent Lords. I'm afraid it's urgent. You are needed at once in Orgrimmar. At last, the messenger had the wisdom to sense the mood, his pale eyes flicking between Lorfmar and Felistra, then descending on an audible gulp to where they held hands. I will be going. Yes, you will, Lorfmar sighed. I will return at once, he paused, glancing at the first arcanist before correcting himself. I will return when I am able. Of course, Regent Lords. Forgive the intrusion, Regent Lords. My mistake, Regent- By the grace of the Sunwell, be gone! Felistra laughed at his outburst, standing and closed at the distance between them. All the waiter furiously yanked the boy away, no trace of the messenger remaining, save for a drop of sweat on the floor. Now... Lorfmar shook his head, joining her with an exasperated chuckle. Where were we? I will not keep you long. Tucking herself into the warm crook of his left arm, her free hand came to rest on his chest, and Lorfmar felt his heart rise to meet it. Unless this was a clever ploy to escape the poets, and that messenger was your plan all along. And be forced to leave your side prematurely? He lowered his chin. The mere suggestion wounds me, First Arcanist. But we're not talking of wounds any longer. What were we speaking of? She urged, 
so close that a warm breath bloomed across his chin. Lorfmar took a deep breath, steadying himself, of knowing. Indeed. The silken white plumes of her eyelashes dipped, and then she glanced up at him, and her gaze met his, and Lorfmar wondered how he had so long denied himself this chance. For once, she seemed at a loss for words, no more teasing or provoking, no more prodding, and Lorfmar seized the silence. He thought of her poem, the words lingering in his mind, even if she did not want them to last but a moment. Here I am. Take my fingers to cross the goblet. Take my lips to breathe your first air. Take my lips, Lorfmar intended to, realizing that the poem might have meant solely for him, a call to action that he would gladly answer. His lips did not have far to travel, but even that small distance left him breathless with wanting. A hundred doubts descended to taunt him, but Lorfmar shrugged them off. It could be pain and rejection and difficulty that followed, but in that moment, their moment, she wanted him, and that was enough to sustain him. Lorfmar did not resist the urge to be closer to her. He did not resist anything that came next. Not the slight hitch of anticipation in her breath, or the brief quarrel of who would bend their head which way. His lips met hers, where wine and poetry lingered. And he felt, without hesitation, that he belonged there. The listener's fingers touched his chin, holding him. And the whole of Sudamar went still and silent for them. For their moment, he did not let go. The world outside their kiss could wait.